Hello. In this week's Torah portion, Kedoshim, we read the following commandments. Quote, you shall not make gashes in your flesh for the bed or incise any marks on yourselves. I am the Lord, unquote. What does it mean? And how far does it extend? People frequently alter their bodies with circumcisions, ear piercings, nose piercings, other body piercings, tattoos, plastic surgery of the nose or breasts, facelifts, sex changes, amputation of body parts, organ donations, even nail cutting, hair cutting and shaving. All of these procedures involve cuts or incisions. What is allowed and what isn't? Let's first speculate on possible reasons for the commandment. First, it was an idolatrous practice. Idolaters used to cut their flesh when a loved one died and their priests tattooed themselves with the name of their idols. Second, we are created in the image of God, Betzelem Elohim, and it makes sense to assume we should not modify that image. Third, circumcision is a commanded and unique sign of our special covenant with God, so allowing other signs would cheapen it. Fourth, there's the issue of modesty, sniut. Body alterations sometimes involve private parts that are then shown off. Finally, there's always the risk of infection. More generally, the Torah enjoins us not to follow the ways of the Gentiles. Quote, you shall not copy the practices of the land of Egypt where you dwelt, or the land of Canaan to which I'm taking you, nor shall you follow their laws. You shall not follow the practices of the nation that I'm driving out before you, for it is because they did all these things that I abhorred them. But to what extent this applies is often a matter of dispute. Let's now review what mutilations are allowed. First, some mutilations are an act of God. For example, God takes a rib from Adam to create Eve. Also, after Cain kills Abel, God brands him, quote, and the Lord put a mark on Cain to avoid him being killed by anyone who meets him, unquote. One midrash says that the mark was a letter of the divine name inscribed on his forehead. Another midrash says, quote, Rabbi Yehuda said he caused the orb of the sun to shine. Rabbi Nehemiah said he caused leprosy to break out on him. Rav said he gave him a dog to protect him. Abba Yosei said he made a horn grown out of him, and so forth. At various times, God sends plagues that affect appearance. Examples, God gives temporary leprosy to Moses for speaking ill of the Israelites, and to Miriam for speaking ill of Moses. Second, some mutilations are commanded. The Torah mandates circumcisions for newborn males. God tells Abraham, quote, you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and that shall be the sign of the covenant between me and you. And throughout the generations, every male among you shall be circumcised at the age of 30, of 80, of eight days. Also, regarding a Hebrew slave who refuses to be freed in his seventh year of servitude, the Torah says, quote, his master shall pierce his ear with an awl, and he shall then remain his slave for life, unquote. Third, some ornamental mutilations are allowed. For example, the Torah does not prohibit nose rings or ear piercings. Here are some proof verses. Quote, I inquired of Rebecca, whose daughter are you? And I put the ring on her nose and the bands on her arms. To build the golden calf, Aaron said to the Israelites, take off the gold rings that are on the ears of your wives. To build the tabernacle, men and women came bringing brooches, earrings, rings, and pendants, gold objects of all kinds. The Midrash adds, when they built the golden calf, the Israelites gave earrings, and when they built the tabernacle, they also brought earrings. It was with earrings that they sinned, and with earrings that they became reconciled to God. We have brought an we have brought as an offering to the, to the Lord's gold, omelets, bracelets, signet rings, earrings, and pendants. And the practice continued in the days of the prophets. Quote, Ezekiel, I decked you out in finery. I put a ring in your nose and earrings in your ears. In Isaiah, the Lord said, because the daughters of Zion are so vain, I will strip off the signet rings and the nose rings. This is also well documented in Talmudic times. Quote, 
On Shabbat, a tailor must not go out with a needle stuck in his garments, nor a carpenter with a chip in his ear. Rashi informs us that men wore earrings that indicated their trades. More quotes from the Talmud. And these are the women's ornaments, necklaces, earrings, finger rings, and nose rings. Girls may go out on Shabbat with ribbons and even with chips in their ears. Consider the case of a king who desired to marry a certain woman, but was told by people that she was poor, possessing only two nose rings as her own. Other body piercings are also generally allowed by Jewish law, according to response by Rav Moshe Feinstein and the Lubavitcher Rebbe. In areas where body piercing is practiced only by women, men may not do it. Fourth, some mutilations are allowed if they save lives. The saving of a life, pikuach nefesh, takes priority over most other commandments. For example, one is allowed to remove diseased organs surgically. Specifically, one may amputate a leg because of gangrene, a disease which causes tissues to degenerate because less blood goes to them. On the matter of transplants, one is allowed to accept organs from dead people. There is some pushback based on the likelihood that the transplant will be successful and on whether brain death is considered death. One is also allowed to accept organs from living people, provided the recipient's life is at risk without the donation and the donor's life is not at risk. And no organs are harvested from the living to store in organ banks for future use. However, giving blood is allowed, even if just to store in a blood bank and even if the donor gets paid. Fifth, plastic surgery is usually allowed. Influential Israeli rabbi Shlomo Zalman Auerbach writes, quote, if plastic, plastic surgery is done to prevent suffering and shame caused by a defect in looks, this will be permitted based on the Tosafot and the Gemara, since the purpose is to remove a blemish. However, if the only reason is for beauty, this is not permitted. Indeed, Tosafot said, if the only pain suffered is embarrassment to walk among people, then it is permissible because there is no greater pain than this. This allows body reconstruction after cancer treatment or injury, for example, breast reconstruction. For nose job or facelifts, face, facelifts, it would have to be proved that the appearance prevents a normal life. For example, that it causes severe psychological distress or prevents a woman from finding a husband. For men, the Talmud says that ugly people make the best scholars. Psychological leniencies can be controversial because they're easy to abuse. Sixth, shaving is allowed. The Torah says, you shall not round off the side growth on your heads or destroy the side growth of your beards, unquote. But the Talmud clarifies that the restriction is only that the blade must not touch the skin. Therefore, only single blade razors are forbidden. Scissors, electric razors, or chemical depilatories are allowed. Among ultra-Orthodox Jews, beards and side locks are very important for reasons rooted deeply in Kabbalah and mysticism. The Arizal taught that hair has spiritual significance. Note that Nazirites may not shave. Mourners may not shave or get a haircut for 30 days. This includes the period of the counting of the Omer and the three weeks between 17 Tammuz and 9 Av. Men should not shave armpits or pubic hair in communities where it's considered only feminine behavior. Let's now review mutilations, mutilations that are not allowed. First, mutilations done to avoid pregnancy are forbidden. Examples are sterilization by castration, vasectomy, or tying the tubes. There are a few exceptions, such as unusual childbirth pain. Second, mutilation of the dead are forbidden. Autopsies are generally not allowed, unless it can be proved that they save lives, for example, through medical discoveries. Third, sex change operations are prohibited, except in rare situations. Fourth, tattoos are prohibited. Our verse clearly prohibits tattoos, permanent etchings on the skin. The Mishnah confirms it. There was a dissenter, quote, Rabbi Shimon ben Yehuda said in the name of Rabbi Shimon, 
he is liable for it too, only if he writes the name of an idol there. Because the Torah states, you shall not place a tattoo inscription on yourselves and adds, I am the Lord. However, paint and stick-ons are allowed, but discouraged, because they may appear to be tattoos, the concern of Marit Ayn, the appearance of a transgression. Tattoos must be voluntary to be reprehensible. Jewish law says, if the tattoo was made involuntarily in the flesh of another, the one to whom it was done is blameless. If a tattoo includes God's name, the name must be covered when bathing or using the bathroom. Water is allowed to erase it on its own, but one is not allowed to erase it actively. If someone has a tattoo of dubious taste on his left arm, is he allowed to put the tefillin there or should he use his right arm instead? One answer is, he must keep the tefillin on the left arm, near the heart, as instructed by the Torah, but cover up the tattoo with his sleeve. What are the penalties for tattoos? First, tattoo removal is not mandatory. Therefore, Holocaust survivors and other victims don't have to go through the pain, risk, and expense of having their tattoo removed. There are no restrictions on the burial of Jews who have tattoos, no limits on their participation in synagogue rituals, and someone with a tattoo may convert to Judaism. In conclusion, voluntary physical changes to the body are generally not allowed in Judaism. However, in some other special cases, they are allowed. Shabbat Shalom.